This episode of Long Night with Vish Khanna is brought to you by Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, CFRU 93.3 FM, and Granddad's Donuts, and was recorded before a studio audience on Friday, March 29th, 2019. <laughs> This episode of Long Night with Vish Khanna is brought to you by Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, CFRU 93.3 FM, and Granddad's Donuts, and was recorded before a studio audience on Friday, March 29th, 2019. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. It's nice to be here. The season finale. Well, wow, that's kind of sad, isn't it, James? It's the end. Well, hopefully it's not the series finale. We always get canceled after every season, and then they bring us back for diversity, I think. We're like Parks and Rec. We've just had a lot of series finales, and then, and then we just come then back we come mysteriously. Back. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's nice to see you all here, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our first guest. Our first guest tonight is a musician, media personality, gamer, and the co-host of the Discovery Channel Canada show, Vintage Tech Hunters. Please make some noise for Sean Hatton, everyone. Sean. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. What's that? Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, you're back on the show. Back, you, you, I'm back. You are a, a repeat guest. I've endured a, another format of this show where it was a, a little more video intensive. You used the word endured. I've, endure, which, I've endured the show. I've come back. I enjoyed it, obviously. Well, I don't know if you did. You used no, the word I endured. I, no, it's, uh, no, I'm it's, just giving you a hard time. It's great to have you on the show. And congratulations. So since the last time you were on the show, you now have your own show. Yes, is it still going on? Everything's fine with Vintage Tech Hunters? You could watch it still. It's, uh, yes. it's in reruns of the first season. It aired uh, starting November 5th of last year. Yeah. And wrapped up just around the Christmas holidays. Discovery did this big um, day-long marathon. So even though I was at my parents' place for Christmas and I was standing in the living room, they were like, you're in the way. You're in the way. I'm watching you on TV. And I'm like, I'm right here. Isn't that, that's, a, that's, that's tough it's, love. It's rude. In its own way, yeah. yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Your parents are in Brampton? They are. Where are they from originally? Uh, they're from, my dad's from India. My mom's from Pakistan. Nice. Well, yeah. my, my parents are from India as well. And uh, I grew up in Cambridge. But Brampton, is a, is it, was that a good place to grow up in? Is it an artistic person? Well, uh, <laughs> I know Scott Thompson no, well, from Kids in the Hall grew up uh, in Brampton. Uh, well, let's use this word again, endured. I think a lot of artistic <laughs> people have endured growing up in a, a not-so-artistic town. You know, it's a working-class town. Yeah. There's, of course, uh, Mayfield High School, which a lot of uh, people have gone to. Uh, Michael Sarah went there as well. Did you know Michael Sarah in Brampton? Uh, no, but he almost ran over me and my dog once when I was walking, uh, walking her up the sidewalk, and I was like, who's this fucking wanker, like, riding his bike on the sidewalk? And I looked at him, and I'm like, oh, it's Michael Sarah. Was he like, you know, famous Michael Sarah? Yeah, he was. This was post Scott Pilgrim. He was still like hanging out in Brampton because it was around his birthday, I think. Yeah, his <laughs> folks still lived there. Right. Okay. Yeah. Do you, I mean, I don't want to disparage poor Michael Sarah. Are, are you? Are you? He's okay? not poor. No. Were you kidding me? <laughs> the dude's got more money than both of us right. put together. That's at least. true. That's probably yeah. fair. Anyway, so you you came up in Brampton. How did you get into like kind of arts and culture? Uh, I think just kind of accidentally, I've always been interested in, um, you know, 
listening to, playing music, and then also um, I played a lot of video games growing up. I don't know if anyone else can kind of relate to that, but I, I, I yeah, there you go. I, I somehow conned my way into video game journalism. I did journalism in, uh, in college and then ended up on a TV show called The Electric Playground, which uh, is still running in uh, YouTube format. Um, the guy who started it, Victor Lucas, is still doing that. But it was a, one of the longest running uh, Canadian TV shows about video games. In fact, probably the longest running t show about video games, period, in right. the world. Um, that's a big thing. I mean, people love video games they have for some time, but that's like a, that might be the most mighty industry right now. It seems indestructible. It's, uh, it's a tough industry to be in as a creative person. You know, uh, studios do still close, unfortunately. There's a lot of pressure on game studios to make AAA games, have them sell, you know, millions of, uh, of copies around the world. Um, but it is a good industry, and, and obviously it's been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, I grew up in the age of, like, where video games were becoming a thing, you know, right. the Sega-Nintendo wars of the 90s and that kind of thing. What was cool about the Electric Playground for me when I was a kid watching it is it was my only way to see video games in action where I wasn't at a friend's place or I wasn't playing it myself because, you know, the internet wasn't really a thing and you could only see video games um, in a magazine format. So it would be, like, these blurry screenshots and then along came they the made magazines playground. where they took photos of video games and then oh, yeah. put them in the magazine yeah yeah and and like nintendo power magazine you can you can enter your high score in nintendo power and they gave you tips of how to take photos of the screen like it had to be a dark room turn the flash off take all the photos on your camera roll like use all 24 photos <laughs> Because they might not turn out, right? It's hard. It's hard to take a photo of a CRT screen. Sounds like a scam to me, all of it. it turn your lights off. You know, it was a scam to sell film right. and develop film. R you know? Right. And meanwhile, like, my, I would have to sneak my mom's camera when there was, like, two shots left to prove to my friends that I beat Street Fighter Two on the hardest setting because you get, like, a special screen. And then those photos didn't turn out, so they just thought I was lying. Now, just so we're clear here, you're a grown man. I'm, I'm 40 years old now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this video game stuff is in your past? No, I still play video games. You play games. video yeah. games a lot? Yeah, I played, you, I played video games today, actually. Should yeah. you be admitting that? I'm admitting people? it, I don't. yeah. So do you still engage in what you call video game journalism? Uh, I, I, you know, I tweet about what I'm playing. And, and Does that count as journalism? I guess. I mean, tr you know, lots of people take people on Twitter seriously. And That's true. Why That's not true. take me seriously? I mean, but this, look at me. This was your claim. Like, this was a, an important uh, step, I suppose, in raising your profile, your video gaming. Oh, engagement. yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah lo lots of people wouldn't even know. I mean, most people here don't know who I am or care, but... Uh, uh, how about a round of applause for Sean Hatton? <laughs> <laughs> but from... From Brampton. Br Brampton zone. Um, yeah, it, it, I guess I still do maintain some yeah. sort of video game cred, let's say, because right. I'll tweet like, oh, I just picked up the new No More Heroes game, and people will reply like, what do you think? What do you think is good as, good as the last they one? They trust your judgment on yeah. the video game. Uh, yeah. So, so your, new, your show that you have now, Vintage Tech Hunters, there is occasionally a, a moment where you'll get to play an old school video game, right? Yes. But that's not the premise of the show. Tell the people who haven't seen the show, what's the show? Okay, so uh, the premise of the show is me and my business partner slash friend, Bohush Blahut, which is his real name. Um, Just be we, careful. That's a Czech it's, name. It's, it's a, a Czech, solid I don't wanna, Czech name. You know, I don't want to insult Can the... Can you say the, it again, though? I missed it. Bohush Blahut. It's a good name. It's a very good name. Yeah. And he's a good man as well. He's got a, a big commanding voice and... I'm, I'm not doing it justice, but uh, he and I, we travel across North America in a comically large panel van. Um, like and we, Dumb and Dumber. Basically, yeah, but it's not as cool as that one. Right. I mean, if it, if it had, like, the fur and stuff on With it, you the, know, the dog and thing, the, yeah. yeah. No, it's just this big, um, basically like a sprinter van. Yeah. Um, you know, I could be kidnapping people, but I'm actually just going and, and going to flea markets and dusty barns and basements and, uh, and swap meets and, and antagonizing old white men into giving me their technology for a good price. You end up uh, bartering a lot with, yeah. with white men. Well, yeah. Uh, I, I which, think given our background, it's, you know, a I lot mean, of bartering with white men, I will say. That's in my yeah. blood. Yeah. Did you barter a lot with the white men? <laughs> well... 
Yes, yes, and and some and some white women as well, and some and some. Oh, that's why you kicked some, it up a notch. I never did that. Of, and some people of color as well. I mean, right, I, I okay. don't want like there's a, there's a good representation, but let's be honest. So I mean, you're you're, ba- you're bartering for people's uh, uh, junk. Their yeah. de- their detritus. Yeah. Their, the, the refuge, it's, the unwanted and undesirable items, the stuff a toilet would reject. It, see, the problem is the people that I'm talking to... Have I mischaracterized to, the show? Well, you, you know, you can have your own interpretation of the show. You've seen it. That's I've fine. seen the show. I think, I, I think from... But you're, you're going, you're junk collecting a little bit, right? It's junk, yeah. Just but some. it's cool junk. It, like, the stuff that sticks out to me is like things that I, I feel are, you know, this is an interesting piece of technological history. You know, back in the day, you would have a device that would just... You know, it would just measure amperage, and that's all it would do. But it was this beautiful, intricate, ornate wooden box right. with glass and like really nice gold gilding and all sorts of unnecessary stuff. It's like an actual a piece of art. Like someone spent a lot of time building this There's, amp meter. There was a machine profiled on your show that uh, was on the cutting edge of making dog tags, which I oh, found. Oh, yes. It's like, it, it looks like a typewriter, yeah. but before I, I learned on your show, that before the dog tags that the military people used to use, like someone would hand hammer them and then they invented, what's it called? Do you remember the name of the machine? I don't, I don't remember either. Anyway, the name of the, But it, th- there's that and then it, in, there's a, the camera gun from World War One. That was that, ridiculous. And you found that in like a guy's, like what was it, a yeah, so the barn camera, or something? Yeah, the camera gun was in a uh, weird junk shop in Welland where this guy basically just had everything. Also, a disturbingly large number of Jim Lee variant cover X-Men number one from the 90s like he had hundreds of them and I'm like this is the one with the fold out cover this was going to be worth something and he just had stat- like hundreds of these were they counterfeit or something no they were the real deal because like, he wanted $8,000 for that camera gun right? he wanted yeah he wanted a lot for the gun and we didn't we don't like look at me I don't carry that kind of money you walk around with like what two grand on you it seems I got two grand sometimes yeah you have it on we, you now no. Okay, you're safe. No. So you're you're bartering with these people, and they've got what they think is valuable, and you've and then you, I, I, that's the part of the show I don't understand. You're buying it to make a profit, but yeah, we well, but we never see what happens with the profit. Well, you, I I'm still waiting for some of the profit. To be honest, I mean we've got a lot of this stuff in storage, and people who have seen the show know like okay, you bought this pinball machine, and they they contact us and they're like oh how much do you want for this pinball machine? Well, oh. kind of, yeah. It's uh, your show is basically eBay. It's eBay, the TV show, yeah. starring me and Bohush. Right. And but the, but unlike eBay, where a lot of the antagonism is in you know the post uh, purchase experience. That's uh, right. The antagonism in this show is before the purchase. You know, sometimes you buy something on eBay and you get it, and it's like, well, this is not really what I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. And you kind of leave a neutral feedback, and then people get kind of kind of caddy with you yeah. uh, back and forth. Uh, we do that before we actually buy the thing. And sometimes we don't actually buy it because people are, you know, they want a little too much. Um, the, the problem with um, any any sort of item where people ascribe a value to it, they've got this emotional attachment. You're like, this was my Sega Genesis when I grew up. It's worth $200. It's like, no, it's not worth $200. Well, too. you did you not bring something with you? I did. So what I brought was something I found in uh, a flea market just outside of... Ottawa. Okay, do you want me to help? Do you, want, do you need, do you need uh, help? I think I'm okay for okay. now. Okay. Okay, you know what? You better hold on. Okay, yeah, I thought so. So this is, a, this is something you found in a flea market near Ottawa. Oh, look at this. Wow, it's an Omnicord. It is. Oh, wow. Applause for the Suzuki Omnicord. So, um, Linda, I don't know that the applause sign needed to go up for the okay. Omnicord. Okay, Omnicord applause. It has no feelings. I mean... It, it, um, always a upping the applause ante, if I might say. Oh, thank you very much. Anyway, yeah, I, this I is a, I, I'm familiar with Omnicord. You know who uses these a lot? Daniel Lanois. Do you know him? I do. Well, yeah. not personally, but I know of him. He uses these he, all the time. And it, he makes beautiful music. Ambient kind of tone. Yeah. Do, do you know this, who else uses this? Yes, uh, we, the Flight of the Concords. Yes. In fact, J- Jermaine Clement has a very large collection of Omnicords. There's only like five different models, mm-hmm. but he's got a lot of them. So have you tested this one? Does it work? Oh, yeah. We, we tested it as soon as we found it. It worked. I made a song. Um, it wasn't this, a good song. Is this all of this uh, an elaborate ploy to make me buy this Omnicord from you? <laughs> You're... I, I actually bought this uh, Omnicord myself. Oh, it's yours. So it's, okay. it's mine. 
Um, do you want to play something for us? I need to plug it in first. I don't think we have power. We, there's like a power bar right there, man. Oh. I see it. So, okay. Yeah. We probably should have worked this out before yeah. the show started. <laughs> okay, let's... We were just killing 20 minutes doing nothing. Yeah, we're just like, well, we're, we'll start the show Does it not eventually. take batteries or something? It does, but the battery part doesn't work, and I also... It takes... It takes 8D <laughs> size batteries. No, that wait. It's not a common number of okay, batteries it's C, or battery it's types. It's C size batteries, but it might as well be D. Who's Can I? Doing D I batteries. So no, they didn't have lithium ion. Back then? Well, how about, okay, you know what? Maybe we can play it later. We'll do. Which we'll is do code that. for yeah. we're not going to hear from this machine. It's, on it's the show. beautiful. But can I show you something? Tell yes. me what this would be worth. Okay. I have on my wrist a Timex Iron Man watch. Nice. That I, now, I have, since I was, I used to say, Dad, what time is it? And he'd say, Pardon? Hammer time. And I'd say, What time is it? He's like, God, stop asking me what time it is. I'm just going to buy you a watch. So I'd like, my dad loved me, by the way. He loves me but he didn't want to hear from me. So he bought me, I was like six years old wearing a wristwatch, which is probably a little unusual. But anyway, I've only ever owned Iron Man watches my whole life. And this particular model I purchased in 1999. It is the 20th anniversary of this watch. It is the Cal Ripken of wristwatches, if I might say. Nice. What would this wristwatch be worth on your show if you were to find this? Well... We did buy a wristwatch. We bought uh, one of the very first uh, LED vacuum tube wristwatches, um, and that was worth the, uh, quite a pretty penny. But these were, were very mass-produced, and uh, you know they say Timex takes a, ticking, takes a licking and keeps on ticking. And these do actually last a long time. Yours is 20 years old. I had that same one as well. Yeah. So seeing that brings back a lot of uh, personal memories. So I think... Because I have this emotional connection, I might be fooled into paying a little bit more. But I'd give you 20 bucks for it right 20 now. bucks? Yeah. That, I do carry that kind of money with you me. You know, I, I, I know it can hear me right now, and I don't want it to malfunction. I don't really want to steal that watch. No, no, no. Ever. I was going to say, I actually bought, I've been so fearful that this watch was going to stop working, mm-hmm. that I actually bought a backup. Nice. And it looks exactly the same. And you know where I got it? eBay. eBay. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know what watches actually went up in value quite a bit? Remember the, the Transformer watches? It was like a little robot that turned into a square watch. You could pop them off the wrist. Are you having an then, acid flashback? I don't no. remember. It would these. turn into a robot. Really? Yeah. I remember calculator. I had a calculator watch. Oh, those this has cool. uh, been Watch Talk with uh, watch talk. Vish and Sean. We, we do have to take a, we have to take a break. So uh, we're, we're, I'm, I'm being told by... My producer, that it's time to I take a break. I didn't see but your producer say that, but is there any? Um, <laughs> I'm just bartering. I'm bartering <laughs> with the producer. Is there anything uh, that you want to tell us uh, to look out for in terms of the show might come back? That's one yep, thing. Yeah, we're waiting to hear news about a uh, season two. The the folks who've put the show together, um, they are selling it uh, worldwide. So I'm sure people who are, are going to be able to watch me with uh, a sexy Spanish dubbed voice or a French voice, it's it's going. Uh, are you going to do the dubbing? That would be cool. No, oh. no, it's not me. Unfortunately, oh. I'd like to. I wish we could get into this more because this whole show about history and tangible objects from the past in relation to our existence now where we're, we're being conditioned to get rid of everything yeah. tangible and, and uh, you know, uh, this forced technical, uh, technological erasure. Yeah. It's getting into grad school it's, discussion there, territory. Well, there, there's, there is the uh, conspiracy theory of planned obsolescence, yes. right? Like Apple releases a new phone and suddenly your old phone doesn't really work as well as it used to. Yeah. Like, is it just in our minds or is it true? And just, my phone like, stopped working just now when yeah, you said that. See, I was monitoring see, but something time. like this, like this is decades old and it still works as good as it did right. the first day. You just got to keep stuff clean, treat it with a little bit of love and respect, you know. I said go that a like a way. real dad yeah, or, or a parent. Just Vish, take clean. care of your shit. Take man. care of my shit, okay. Yeah. Uh, where can people learn more about you on the internet? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at Megashaun, M-E-G-A-S-H-A-U-N. And uh, enjoy my fart jokes and jokes about robots and stuff like that. He's a wonder and a, and a gentleman, and I'm happy he's back on the show. How about a round of applause for Sean Hatton, everyone? <laughs> we were, we're just going to take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, Baroness Von Sketch Show will be here and other stuff. So stick, stick around. Thank you very much. All right. 
right, we're back. How about another round of applause for Sean Hatton? Mega Sean. Thank you, Sean. All right, it's time to move our show along. Uh, our next guests are incre incredible. Stop the show, no. What? What's going on? There's a guy out there backstage, and he's eating samosas. That's fine. What's wrong with... Why are you coming to me with this, by the way? It's awkward. What, I'm not the samosa police. What's the big deal? He dipped them in mayonnaise. Jesus, Hindu Christ. <laughs> That's an outrage. I'm going to go deal with this. Uh, I do have a samosa authority. James, take over the show. I'll be back. Uh, what? <laughs> Finally. <laughs> All right, so I've been sitting here for like six years not saying anything, so uh, if it's cool with you, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity while Vish is attending to uh, an emergency uh, to uh, tell you a little about myself. Um, I'm getting to be an old man. Um, I'm getting up there in years. And I've realized now that uh, the whole process is just passing a series of milestones that you're not going to reach. Like, oh, I'm not going to be a professional athlete. <laughs> now, that, that one came early for me. I was seven. You know, I'm, I'm not going to make that top 30 under 30 list. But uh, I recently passed a sort of disturbing milestone, which is uh, I've realized that I'm too old for the apocalypse. You know, yeah, it was the end, end of the world comes, we all imagine there's going to be like that ragtag group of survivors, and we all picture that we're going to be amongst them, right? <laughs> nope, not me. But James, you might say, if you remembered my name. Uh, you know, in the, in the group that we're picturing, there's, there's like, there's an older guy. And, uh, I mean, be honest, the, the older guy you're picturing in your group, he, he kind of looks like me. <laughs> and I, I do admit that I do maybe give off a bit of a doomsday prepper vibe. But, uh, but no, the guy you're picturing is a rural beardo. I am very much an urban beardo. The only thing I can forage for is records. That's it. Uh, and it's because I haven't learned any skills, any survival skills or arguably other skills. Uh, it's because I've been a magazine editor my whole life. And uh, yeah, that does not prepare you for the end times. <laughs> you know, it's funny because like if you're making a wish list at the end of the world of like useful skills to have around, like people that could do good stuff, like, it's, you, it's pretty far down the list before you get to a real knack with the written word. <laughs> That's low. That's not even me yet, either. I'm, I'm still a few more jobs down for when you're worried about your spelling and grammar and you don't want to be dangling a participle in the end times. That's, I'm very useful then. I'm, I'm very useful in that scenario. Uh, my wife travels a lot for work, and uh, she recently went away for a couple weeks left Eric and I at home alone, just the two of us. And uh, we have a very happy marriage, but I do confess that I live in terror of my wife's disapproval. And so I figure that the best way that I can demonstrate my core competence as an adult human is by the state of the house when she returns, right? Like that's the best way to demonstrate that I've been on top of things while she was away. Uh, I did briefly consider recreating the house exactly as it was the moment that she left. You know, when you go away for a long time and it's the second you walk back in, you're just transported back to the moment that you left with the half-drunk glass of water on the counter and the pot soaking in the sink and the phone cord that you forgot that's just sitting on the table taunting you. So I was going to do that, but it was going to take a lot of work and reference photography. It wasn't going to have the impact that I was going for when she walked in. So the vibe I decided to go for was really responsible house sitter. I figured like that was the right sort of standard to try and reach. I wasn't, I mean, Eric, I wasn't worried about. Uh, he's, uh, he's 10 now. He's a good boy. He's very independent. And uh, yeah, now that I think about it, I barely saw him the whole two weeks that she was gone. <laughs> I mean, every once in a while, he'll show up and cry for attention or whatever, but you just shove a cookie in his face. He's fine. <laughs> Eric's a dog. I, I may not have clarified that earlier. So, uh, so uh, in preparation for my wife's return, uh, I set aside two days 
uh, to clean the whole house. I mean, let's be honest, I didn't do two days worth of work. I smoke a lot of pot, I take a lot of breaks. But over the course of two days, totally wired, like dusted, cleaned, organized, filed, the whole bit. Uh, and I'm, I'm super proud of it. I think I've really nailed it this time. And uh, so she comes home and she's in the house for approximately 120 seconds. And she appears holding a terracotta pot. And she says, this is dead. <laughs> now, I've just been over every inch of this place over the last two days with breaks. And I have never seen this thing before in my life. Like, could, could someone have snuck it into the house somehow? I, I think this plant is a plant. Uh, I'm a very progressive person, uh, politically speaking. I'm woke. But I have to say that uh, as a straight white guy, that I do struggle with my wokeness sometimes. I mean, I want to be out there on the vanguard of change. Like, I want to take a leadership position in making things better for marginalized communities. So I racked my brain, like, what's the best thing that I can do? And I finally figured it out. Nothing. No, seriously, nothing is the best thing that I can do. If, if anybody needs to take a seat on the bench, it's, it's white guys. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys have uh, studied a lot of history. I've been looking into it recently we've been on the wrong side of some really terrible things. It's true. Don't just take my word for it either. Ask any woman of color if white men should sit down and shut up. You have a vigorous nodding coming back at you, at least. A vigorous nodding. So my wife went off to the Women's March, and, uh, you know, because of my wokeness, like, I, I totally want to be there. I love everything about it. I love the hey, hey, ho, ho, something we dislike has got to go. I love all the clever signs, like, we all remember all the regime change that's been brought about by a really bitingly worded sign. You know, I want to I wanna be there and, and raise my voice in solidarity. But again, woke, also recognize that there may be women there who don't appreciate me, just like flaunting my toxic masculinity all over the place. And I don't want to spoil anyone's good time, like, that's an empowering... Uh, space that that should be respected and so uh, I shouldn't go I should not go to that March um, So it turns out that I get credit for wanting to go I get credit for recognizing I shouldn't go and I don't have to go <laughs> so off my wife goes to change the world and uh, I get the afternoon off I have to say my favorite thing about being woke is the naps Oh, Vish has uh, returned from the samosa emergency. Yeah, hey, what's going on? What are you doing? I just, I just, you know, kind of, uh, it's my show now. What? Season seven, <laughs> Long Night with James Keast. <laughs> what? What happened? What? I left for a samosa emergency and colonialism appeared. That's weird. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I'm a little winded and I don't know what's going on. We're going to take a break and then Aurora and Jen from Baroness Von Sketcher will be up next. Thanks for being here. Stick around. <laughs> this episode of Creative Control is brought to you by Planted Bean Coffee in Guelph and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. And we, uh, my son and I, sometimes go to Planted Bean Coffee so I can pick up uh, some coffee. What do you get there? Well, I like their gelato. It's really good. And for some reason, I'm a kid that likes coffee. That's true. You do like uh, to have a little slurp of coffee every once in a while. What goes better with coffee in Guelph than donuts from Hamilton? Granddad's Donuts, amazing donuts. Do you have a favorite donut? Yep, it's a Boston cream. Yeah, those are pretty good. And they've got those at Granddad's. They've got good, full-sized, old-fashioned donuts. You can't go wrong. If you want to learn more about these places, and you should, go to planetbeancoffee.com and granddads.ca. Right, sir? Right. Welcome back. Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to Long Night. Our next guests are members of a very excellent and acclaimed sketch comedy troupe and TV program called Baroness Von Sketch Show. How acclaimed are they? Well, just this week, Baroness Von Sketch Show won four Canadian Screen Awards 
And the week is, no, it's not even over yet. You could win more. Can, is that right? No, no. They, all our categories are done. Oh, okay, sorry. We well, could steal some, though. I mean, we could bummer. mug somebody from an award. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter how you get the award as long as you have it, right? Exactly. That's true. Uh, I'm thrilled they could join us tonight, so please say hello to Aurora Brown and Jennifer Whalen of Baroness Watts Ketchup. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hello. Hey. Thank you so much for being here. It's I, our pleasure. You win awards. You don't need to be here. I appreciate you being here. We wanted to come back. We, we had that other experience. Yeah. We, we we also, a, we hadn't won the awards when you asked us, so it was a different yeah. time for us then. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it will help if we go on that show. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we spoke, what, when the show started, we spoke, right? Yeah, it was, yeah first it was, the first season was just airing, because we were, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was fun. We had a yeah. good time, yeah. yeah. So we may cover some ground that we covered then, because uh, when we spoke the last time, I, I didn't know you as people. You were just coming up. You were young. Baroness Von Sketch Show baby, like the Muppet Babies version. So young, so very young. <laughs> dewey, we were Dewey. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we were all learning about each other. Let's start with uh, the show and how it began. Uh, let's, let's, Jen, why don't you tell your version of the story? Aurora will correct it. Sure. Um, where did Baroness Von Sketch Show come from? It was created in the lab. No, it was not. Uh, it began, ooh, my gosh, I guess it's now six years ago, five years ago, something like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't keep track of time. Of course. Really, uh, um, and uh, how it began was Meredith McNeil, who is Canadian, but she had gone to England, and she had come back to work in Canada, and she was doing a show called This Hour Has 22 Minutes. Um, she in met Halifax, Car- right? In Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yeah, she yeah. met Carolyn Taylor. Who, Carolyn, we knew Carolyn uh, because we had done Second City, we being Aurora and I. Not so like you two are friends. Yes. yes. So the other two, you're not as much, you're not no, friends with. No, no, with. fucking hate them. <laughs> I don't really know. They were like strangers. No, no, no. I had, uh, I've known Carolyn for almost 20 years now. Oh, you had, okay. And uh, and uh, we had she and I had been on stage at Second City together, and Jen was also at Second City, so we've also been friends for a very long yeah, time. Yeah, so okay. the three of us knew each other. So the three of us, we had this Second City connection, and then Carolyn and I had both done This Hour Has 22 Minutes. Um, I had left the show at that point, and uh, Carolyn was there, and she met Meredith. And uh, Meredith was kind of wondering where the sketch show was in, in, in Canada, because Britain has a long tradition, and Canadians are known as being funny. But there was a real culture at that time of don't, don't pitch a sketch show. The networks won't make it. Don't do it. And she was like, and also, where are the women, you know, This is a Canadian shows? perspective? Like, don't pitch a sketch show to Canadian yes, networks? Yes. In, in Canada okay. at the time, there was sort of this idea that, you know, you shouldn't do that. Uh, so anyway, so she wanted to do this, and she, and she and Carolyn wanted to do something similar. And so they chatted, and Carolyn was like, I think I know some people. And uh, so, yeah, so it was really the, the synergy of these two kind of brilliant humans coming together and then asking us to uh, mm-hmm. be involved. Yeah. That sounds then, great. That's yeah. good. Do you have a perspective, Aurora, on what Jen was saying about why sketch shows weren't something that networks would desire because they seem to be all the rage these days on some level. No, in no small part to what you guys have accomplished, I would say. I think it does go in waves. Mm-hmm. I will say that I was actually part of a sketch show that was really bad, and I think it actually discouraged people from doing sketch shows. That's right. You were on Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. No, yeah. My brief no, I do, I do think it, it goes in waves. I mean, yeah. uh, and we should say that that's on television. Like, the sketch scene in Canada is very robust. The live sketch scene here, Vancouver, you know, Winnipeg, Edmonton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, there's, there's tons of sketch artists, but it just wasn't making it to TV. And I think... I think also just in general, uh, people are afraid to pitch anything uh, in this country, and sketch is one of those things too. And it just it just had fallen out of fashion. But there was a kind of a, a say a trendy quality to female fronted stuff. Um, whenever you're in the oh, room around that time, and there were people, you know, we you'd go in to talk about like, oh, I have this idea. They'd be like, could it be like Broad City or you know something like that? And right. and um, so we rode that wave hard, and yeah. uh, here we are. Yeah. It's like, remember when everything was vampires? Yeah. Well, yes. we hit it when women were the new vampires. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> so. You guys produce such a volume of stuff. Like, I watch these episodes of your show, and there's so, there's so much stuff going on. How difficult is it to do this show? It seems to me, like, I, I watch it as someone who's vaguely in, I'm like seventh tier Canadian media personality and vaguely in show business. I kind of know what goes on behind the scenes. 
It, this is a lot of work, isn't it's it? It's a ton of work. It's long days. So much work. <laughs> <laughs> Jen saw the sun today, so that was really good. Yes, I, I'm like yeah. I, we're editing season four, so I'm like a I'm like a mole person now. <laughs> and I got out early. I'm like, oh my god, it's a nice day. I almost cried. I'm like, this feels the sun on my skin. People still exist. <laughs> Just. Yeah. 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 Just to give people an idea, like we started writing season four last April, mid-April, mm -hmm. and then we shot it between September and December, and editing now, and you will see it in September again. Yeah, and pre-production so in the summer. Yeah. yeah, so it takes us the whole year. It's a blur, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, we write about a little bit. How yeah. many sketches did we write for season four? Was it like six hundred or something? And then uh, we six hundred. And then we what? send two hundred of those to the network to say which of the you know like yeah. what do you like? And then we shot about one hundred and sixty-five. If I want to say yes, and like a hundred and uh, I think about a hundred and thirty will make the show. We'll but a Baroness Fine sketch show sketch can be thirty seconds. It can yes, be a couple yeah. minutes. It's yeah. yeah. We yeah. need to rethink that. <laughs> <laughs> just That's like, a lot of work. Yeah, write one long sketch that lasts ten yeah. episodes. It would be a lot less work. I was like, why did I choose something that would put me in the makeup chair for four hours for <laughs> yeah. literally two seconds? That, two seconds of screen time. Yeah. Yeah. That is fascinating that you bring that up because I have, as you know, I'm a fan of the show. I follow the show, and I can see production values ramping up a little bit. Mm -hmm. There was a yep. sketch about. Uh, and I forgive me if I forget the name. Were you Karen, the coffee sketch? Is yes. that what it's? Yeah, I'm blanking on the name. Oh wait, 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 Karen, who was trying to get into the club and she couldn't. Wait, get in. isn't there a sketch where you're supposed to get Denver? Denver, Denver. Denver. Uh, Denver. Karen, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yes. I'm sorry, I blanked on the name. Denver. And there's just an elaborate costume stuff going. There's like a lot of stuff going on there yeah. that maybe I assume you have more. Do you have more artistic license to try things? As the show has gotten more successful? We've always had an enormous amount of creative yeah. control, okay. um, which is amazing. Good plug for my podcast. Yeah, it's a good Thank plug you. for your podcast. <laughs> yeah, so we, we came into it sort of knowing that we we wanted that, and um, we'd all had long careers before that and seen the ways that it can, it, it, things, a great idea can kind of fall apart. Uh, so it was really important to us. But yeah, something like that, that was really, that was a really fun sketch to do. But when you, you know, you're writing it and you're talking about it, Carolyn Taylor wrote it. It was just a genius based on a thing that actually happened to me. And um, <laughs> not that I turned into Denver, but I got my cuffs so back and it was Denver. So you said, I'm Jennifer and they wrote And me. they gave me Denver. And then I was mm. like, God, who would I be if I was Denver? And <laughs> Carolyn went, um, but what, we, what so anyway so Denver was described as being kind of Paris Hilton like um, when she transforms but so when you write it you're like oh okay that's funny and then on the day I was like what that meant was a team of of poor uh, like <laughs> God bless their souls they had to paint me I'm a very pale person and they had to yeah. paint me head to toe <laughs> with fake tan orange tan kind if, of stuff if yeah. You, yeah if you watch the sketch uh, again closely you can see when we're, I'm in the coffee shop and I turn you can see a, a brown handprint on my ass where somehow I've touched my own ass <laughs> oh with God. my not quite dry <laughs> thing and it made me create like I, I got all the contouring got the thing I was very judgmental about it and the minute it was done I could not stop taking pictures of myself you looked so good on camera I could not I was like it was, I want it, this all the time it I was a shocking amount of contour like I yeah. was looking at you thinking was like, who mm. would ever do this but then remember like when we were like uh, doing the elevator scene a woman like who looked like you like she was for real oh, yeah. in the wild wearing all that and we were like oh okay you know like that yeah. so we shot that <laughs> at, yeah. at Humber College and it was the day that you sign up for classes yeah. so this is a Wednesday afternoon <laughs> at about yeah. two o'clock and all the crew are like Jen, Jen, oh my god Denver's Denver's on the elevator Denver's on the elevator Denver's on the elevator and she was she was more tan than me, yep. more blonde than me, yep. wearing a pinker outfit than yes. me. And I was like, wait, this is your Wednesday? What is Saturday <laughs> <Yeah>. night like? <laughs> Holy moly. Well, um, I, you, we talked about sort of the era that the show was born and, and maybe perceptions of why people weren't doing sketch. You mentioned creative control. You mentioned you've always had free reign. I think there might be a perception that, that has occurred where people think at the CBC, they're not going to get into edgy comedy. But then I see what you've done. By the way, Aurora, I don't know who wrote this sketch where you're uh, uh, basically giving your child a, a bedtime story. Yeah, I wrote that. that I wrote that. Is, I don't know. Has everyone... Do you know the sketch I mean? Does anyone... No, okay, that's awkward. I um, could probably reenact it. No, it, is, yeah, it, it, it went viral, I would it did say. It a bit. It's genius. Oh, and thank you. I love that sketch more than... It. Like, I, I'm... I, sorry, you're great too. But this sketch... <laughs> So basically, you wrote a thing that just sort of foretells the apocalypse, and it's like I'm a yeah. I'm a parent, right? So I sometimes I'm so putting my kids it, yeah. to bed. I'm like, yeah, everything's gonna be fine, and then I think about 
ecological yeah. collapse and I get very depressed. So good mm. job tapping into that. Thank you. Yeah, that was, um, uh, I have a son and he's almost nine and you know, you, you have the urge to have a kid and then the kid gets there and you're like, oh fuck, what have we done? Like, why <laughs> did I bring this kid yeah. when all this is going on? And you can, this, you know, we don't do too much that's super topical because of the, the time between creating and writing. But you do notice more references to climate change kind of making its way into the show. And that one is, you know, like I'm, my daughter asks me what she'll be and I say like oh first you'll be a doctor but then the ocean currents will shift and mm -hmm. there'll be waves of migration and crop failure so you'll sift through garbage for things and you know raw materials and then the people of your sewer tribe will get an incurable cold and you'll cradle the bodies after, after, as they die and which it, it's it's the, so there you go that's the the Coles notes version of something that's slightly longer we did actually have to I think we had to fight slightly to get this that one this is what I'm yes. getting at yeah. yes, that, we did. I that saw one. that and I'm like hold like that's a that seems to be a sea change in what the CBC would do, and that's maybe a percept. I worked for CBC as well, yeah. but there is this perception that they play it safe. Your show is not safe, and I marvel at that. Something's well, going on there. We um, we did have a. I, I would say that we like eighty five percent of what we want to put up. Is, is generally great with them and then there's like 15% of stuff but but to let you know I think that they've begun to trust us a little bit more uh, Starbucks Denver that was supposed to be shot the year before but we ended up it was kind of a production thing that we were mm. like it'll be worth it for time and it didn't work for time and then there are other sketches that we really wanted to have happen in first season and they didn't go for them and uh, and then after we'd had a couple seasons under our belt, we're like, how about this one again? And they were like, okay, you know. And so um, occasionally there's ones that they were like, we, we're not right. going to put that one on the air. But uh, I would say we have an amazing. It's a it's a very satisfying amount of like you know because yeah. as a creator you want it. Like, I want to say this so comfortable that <laughs> you know you know the words you can't say on television and and they're pretty good. We we you know we you, get some thoughts and some shit. This to say year. There's a lot of motherfucks. And yeah, they're like, okay, guys. Right. Yeah. And we got to know, like, okay, guys, I don't know how many times we have to say this. You can't <laughs> say that you're going to have to bleep that or do something. It's like, oh, right, I guess we, we get a little too. We can say fuck, but we can't say motherfuck. Well, and, but I mean, like, inherently, minute, fucking why? creates mothers. So I don't, yeah. I don't really get it. No, that seems like a weird... And fathers. At least a double standard? Yeah. I, I'm not sure. Why James, is father fuck not a I don't thing. think people say that. That's just yeah. not a thing we say. Father fucker? Yeah, father fucker. Who wants it's to kind of satisfying. No one wants to fuck a dad. That's my viewpoint. You know, that came Ryan Gosling's a dad. And now we know something about you. Yeah. It's more about yeah. me. Yeah. I really... I gotta go talk to my wife. Anyway, please, yeah. uh, James, you had something uh, to say? I have a question, and, and mm. specifically, I mean, uh, we were talking about basically what you can get away with or what the network yeah. will, where the network will put the brakes on. I'm more interested in the the sort of the internal process, and I'm thinking about a specific sketch from, uh -oh. the, la from okay. the last season, unless I'm losing my mind. And it's the... Uh, it's uh, you're all cops and you're dismissing the investigation oh, of sex yeah. crimes. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, I mean, it's one of the greatest things that I've ever seen in comedy. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. It was just, and it was one of those things that I immediately went, "This is, uh, you can't make this sketch with uh, men. Like you couldn't. Mm -hmm. It's fundamental to the sketch mm -hmm. that uh, you're all." women cops but also it's a very delicate balance of uh comedy and the comedy being from pretty uh horrific ideas and uh, i'm just wondering if you could talk about uh well a if there was a network reaction to that sketch but just internally the process of writing that and finding the right tone and how much of that is in the writing and the work and how much of that is in the editing and mm -hmm. yeah. and just the struggle to like really dial that in and and how you guys have sort of evolved to that point as a troupe well mm -hmm. i think i have to you know give a, a huge shout out to meredith and mcneil um she she wanted to do that sketch she spearheaded it and she was so dedicated to making sure that we got it right you know she really it was an idea that she talked about in the first week of the room and it went through a lot of different hands and a lot of different just to make sure that everybody was like okay are we getting this across are we getting this across and there was a lot of like fact checking and making sure we had our facts right and making sure that the tone was right um, so we, it was kind of a labor of love but we all agreed that it was important it was really important and then we were like and we knew it was risky because it's such a fine line but we're like if we can do this you know, and, 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 you know, bring this thing to light and make this joke 
make jokes about this this really awful thing. The, the sketch is about how many uh, rape kits go untested. Yeah. Um, and so we actually had, like, we had multiple endings at one point because we weren't sure. Um, and then the network was, they were, I think, you know, they were supportive through it, but then when we actually went to, actually came to air, then things got a bit weird because um, in, in the our social media company was like, okay, we have to have a protocol here because they are like, you don't understand. You, the trolls who troll this yeah, stuff, yeah. you don't fuck around with them. Yeah. It's serious. We're going to shut down all commenting because what happens is if somebody says something, then they follow the people who've commented. I had no idea people were this awful. Like, it, it yeah. was really... So there was a lot of, like, at that point, you know, discussion about, okay, how do we do this? And also, you know, discussion about, will this be triggering? Do we have to have a trigger warning? And then also we wanted to be responsible and say, okay, here are numbers to call at the end. And then also so just discovering that there wasn't a central number in Canada. It's different in each province. Mm. And how are you going to navigate that? Because we want to make sure that everybody has the access and, and that some provinces are better served than others. So it was like this kind of crazy eye-opening thing. But the network was supportive. And um, you know I think that they were concerned and concerned for us that people might come after us. But it ended up being fine. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, there wasn't really a backlash to it. Um, and, but I would say, again, that was because everybody was so careful about trying to get it right. So, yeah, thank you so much. It was a real labor of mm-hmm. love, and it was really important to us, and it was, it was a huge risk. Can I, I'm going to just tell them the, 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 the Heather story. Like, oh yes yeah um it's uh as, as jen said like that so many people like uh, like everybody in the room took a look at it It was based on that it was actually two it was two issues it wasn't just the rape kits it was the whole unfounded thing robin doolittle did a, a report if for people oh, who haven't seen the scene right. it, about yeah. how many rape charges are deemed unfounded the moment the woman walks in the door and it was like something like 50 percent or something like that in some in some police stations and if you don't know unfounded means they take a look at uh, her and how she's reporting and think I think she's lying and so like half of them were just like not being investigated so that's a real comedy gem right there we were really <laughs> excited about that um, and so like we were even yeah like like the statistics we were doing mm-hmm. ADR to make sure the statistics were as, as good as they could be so what happened we found out much later because like we, you know it meant a lot and we tried really hard to get it right and the tone of it and all that kind of stuff um, the rape kit Jenga tower at the end yeah, you know right. that kind of stuff yeah. So we found out later that the uh, the lawyers at CBC, the, the you know the legal department is there to protect you know like you know copyright infringement and uh, litigation and all that kind of stuff. And they took a look and they're like, we can't even do this. I, I think they might have even done that at this at the script stage. I can't remember. But then uh, Heather Conway, who at the time was president or what's it? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, she uh, found out that they were saying that, and she specifically went to them and said, "No, no, no, uh, they should do." They said, "Like, but the cops might be, you know, like they might be mad." She's like, "Well, they should be uh, if this is how things are going." And mm. so, just to, it was great to get that. But and you know, we didn't even know how specifically we'd been uh, supported at the time. But just so that people know, like. It's not just that the creators have to be into doing stuff and like really giving it like you do need those people up top like really supporting you and, and it makes a difference like all levels of things. And so we were very happy to find that out. You know, I think she, like the, the words that I was quoted was like, those ladies can do whatever they want. And I thought, oh, that was really nice. <laughs> that's great. Uh, yeah. yeah that's so that was our, that's our hilarious uh, heartfelt. <laughs> kind of yeah. But we, it, thank you. We did work really hard. And I do it. think yeah. that uh, bringing up this sketch in particular, like your, your show does this remarkable thing where it balances kind of a uh, minutia, like co- mm. comedic uh, fodder, like the fodder of minutia. But there's this always, I feel like, sociocultural, sociopolitical mm. commentary going mm. on there too. Yeah. And, it's a it's a fantastic show. So you're editing season four. Yes. We don't know what's going to come of this at this point. When it's going to be out? Uh, I would assume sometime in the fall, but right. we don't know our air date yet. And I think you know CBC is you know they, they'll they'll figure out their lineup and and let us know. But we were a fall show this year, so I I mean I think that's the plan. I think Prob- we'll probably yeah. be in the plan. fall again. But you seems need, reasonable. You know, yeah, we, we will yeah. it will air at some point. Weirdly, the last time we were all I think as as far as I know, the, the last time we were all in the same room was at the Tiff Lightbox during JFL forty two. You guys did a an interview. I wasn't on stage with oh, you, but yes. I was in the audience <laughs> and in September, and you announced mm-hmm. that season four. Just so you know, like we're doing season four, yeah. and everyone cheered. Are we doing season five? I just want the similar applause. <laughs> Uh, well, no, I, 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 I can't, I, I can't, I can't okay, say. Okay, all right. That, yeah. I feel, that, that's I feel a fairly, great suggestion. I think so, there yeah, should hopeful. be a season five. I would love there yeah. to be a season I'd five. Like that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, uh, 
So I was confused. Do you have to go back to the the Screen Awards at all? Like, are you just done? Tonight? Yeah. No. 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 We uh, we're on Sunday. <laughs> we're actually we're doing a little bit for the Screen Awards. Yeah. So tune in if you want to see us. So we're I'm confused. Doing... This this is a multi day award show. It's it's a multi yeah yeah yeah. Okay. It, it's like four days. Like so there's like there's the day for the news and the factual, and then there's creative storytelling, which yeah. is the R night, which we won, and then there's the digital night, yeah. and then there's the gala night, which is the actually like super famous people pay attention oh. to these. Awards, the televisable so the tele- like these people are, are hotter they're, they're like a level of attractiveness up so they're like yeah we can devote a night to that okay so you'll be yeah. on that on Sunday night is that yeah right? but in a comic way we yeah. would be there oh okay okay in a hot way and I it, mean we'll try like I'll put on a nice dress but it won't be the same I'm as, so excited about what I'm wearing I'm yeah. excited about what I'm wearing yeah. this is yeah. exciting I can't yeah. wait to see it I hope yeah. All right, is there, uh, where can people learn more about Baroness Von Sketch Show or you too? Do you want to tell people where they can go on the internet? Oh, gosh, I guess that means I should know the website address. Uh, well, yeah, we do have a channel Baroness on YouTube. Baroness Von Sketch yes. uh, on um, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, and who are you on social media? Who are you, wanna, you on social media? Do you want to say media? who you are? Well, I'm Aurora Brown on Twitter. I'm Alola Brown on Instagram. And I'm on Facebook, and uh, so I have a lot of places that you can get. But yeah, we all have our individual. But I think if you go to the Baroness, uh, uh, like Instagram or Twitter, you can find yeah, all it will of just us. Complete, I think. Yeah. And it will find. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By I, the way, I don't want everyone just to search for you. I, this wasn't the plan. Like I just thought it might be nice if. Oh, I want everyone to no, search for Aurora. Follow your exploits. You yeah. know. On the, yeah. Yeah. And Jen, you're on there. I know you're on there. Yeah. Okay. Because I. Uh, yeah. I won't remember because I never look myself up so I think you know if somebody wanted to put Jen and I on a gaming podcast oh yeah we're we're a huge game so so many oh yeah Yeah, Yeah. I was playing video games before I came here today she was yeah and And I'm embarrassed to tell you what I was playing what were you playing I'm really obsessed with Stardew Valley it's so boring and I thank you right right okay but here's the funny okay Stardew Valley nerds (laughs) so I don't actually I have a stepson but I don't have biological children and I was kind of ambivalent about having children and I'm ambivalent about it in the game I married Elliot and he's like let's have a baby I'm like I don't know I've got a lot of plans for the farm. I don't know if I want to have a baby. This could be a sketch. This I, be I a, actually identified with, you're talking about like, you know, like the magazines, you had to take screenshots. Uh, in the 90s, at some point, I was playing Mist, and uh, I think it was Mist 2, mm-hmm. and um, so we were playing on my roommate's CD, you know, it was like a CD-ROM you put in, and we were really stuck at the last part of it, and Mist is crazy. Like, who mm-hmm. here has played it? I have. Yes, right? Yes. Like, it's, it gets in your mind. So it was, it, it was like before, like I think chat rooms existed, but it wasn't fast enough kind of thing. So we ended, we were so stuck. So we're like, let's call the world's biggest bookstore. So we did to see if they had a thing. And it was late at night and the girl, I, we were like, hey, would you mind going to the section? Is there a, like a mist, like, you know, walk through book? She's like, okay, it's not very busy. So she like walked over, got the book and brought it back. She's like, okay, go to the dock and click on the mailbox. <laughs> And we're like, thank you so much. And it totally worked. But that was like my, our like low fine thing. And also, I just, this is like too much. But like, then you were talking about like, uh, like, vi- like the vintage tech thing. So like, I've just started rereading again uh, the Neuromancer trilogy and like how many of William Gibson's books are like based on people looking for old tech or, you know, like old yeah, yeah, yeah. Cl- calculators yeah. and stuff. So I feel like we all have a lot to talk about. And well, we do that's together. an interesting point because we're going to take a very short break and then Sean Hatton is going to join us for a little panel <gasps> discussion. Oh, I should have oh, said that. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> and uh, just before we go to the break, what we've been doing for the panel uh, this season is uh, we take a break. When we come back, when we come back I'm going to ask the audience for a, a topic suggestion. Ooh. So think of that. When we come back, I'm just going to open the floor. If anyone has a topic they want this panel to talk about, shout it out and we'll get to it, okay? Everyone clear? Think about it. We're going to take a break uh, and we'll be back with more. How about a hand for Jen and Aurora of Baroness Von <laughs> This episode of Creative Control is brought to you by Pete's Truck Darrow and The Bookshelf, two fine establishments in Guelph, Ontario. What do you like about Pizza Truck Darrow, sir? Well, I love the pepperoni pizza. It's awesome. And do you like to wash it all down with a specific drink? Oh, yes. I like the Brio. Oh, I love the Brio as well. You can learn more about Pizza Truck Darrow at trocaderoguelph.ca. Best crust in the city, by the way. Yep. And you can call them for pickup or delivery at 519-829-2444. What is the bookshelf? It's not It's not a physical bookshelf. It's a bookstore that also has a bar in it, 
and, and a movie theater. That is absolutely correct, and they're located at 41 Quebec Street in Guelph, and they are the best. You can learn more about them at bookshelf.ca. That's right, Pizza Trocadero and The Bookshelf. Pizza, books, movies, drinks. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. All right, we're back. We're back on Long Night. We don't have a lot of time for a panel discussion, but since we have such a, an amazing uh, panel here, I thought we should take a, a moment to talk. To them. Oh, God, Sean, did you plug in the Omnicord? Sure did. Yeah, I did. Oh, plug the shit out of the Omnicord. It's going to yeah. be a musical panel. Okay, Sean, just let me get a topic before you yeah, yeah. soundtrack us. Just sure. a moment. Okay, does anyone have something they want to hear us talk about? Anything at all? Just shout it out. <laughs> no, uh, okay, I, anything else? Be, Maybe a little niche. <laughs> what was it? Neuromancer? Neuromancer. That, it's the it's the, the, the William Gibson. The William Gibson yeah, novel sure. Let's about. talk about that. Sure. What do you want to say? What do you What do you want to say about uh, Neuromancer? I, I want to talk about Mist a little bit first, because uh, sure, there was a weird time in in uh, video is this games. Is Sierra where, Mist? What kind of Mist? Yeah, is it's Mist. Yeah, the CD ROM. No one had seen graphics like this before. Yeah. And, you know, the sound as the well. Sound. CD ROM. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. CD quality sound from your computer. Yeah. Like a lot of computers didn't even have speakers then, right? Like yeah, yeah you'd you have to get like a sound. Flash, yeah. yeah, like a sound blaster card. Then buy those like twenty dollar Radio Shack speakers. So it's even then it wasn't really that There's good. There's so many things you're talking about that, d- that don't exist anymore, I think. Exactly. Yeah. But, yeah. but, like, the game was so esoteric. Like, what am I supposed to do? Did you oh, get yeah. through it without doing any cheats? No, I don't think Did anybody could. ever? No, I don't yeah. think you could. Oh, no, my friend's dad tried to play it, and as far as I know, he's still trying to play it. Yeah. Because uh-huh. he's like, no, I will figure this out myself, and, yeah. But, I, but that, I remember, like, uh, I think number four is the one, you know, like, playing along, suddenly Brad Dourif shows up. I'm like, I want that guy's career. He's, oh. like, in mm-hmm. movies, he's won Academy Awards, he's oh on God. Deadwood, he's in Mist. Like, come on. Like, Mist 4, yeah. yeah. I would then, love to be in a video game. Yeah. And, and before Star Wars became cool again, mm-hmm. like, uh, Mark Hamill was in Wing Commander. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 so, like, Anyway, I don't know where I was going with that, but, but no, it, it's, it's a nice blast from the yeah. past. Well, to think I want to yeah. I want to try to address the Neuromancer thing, maybe okay. in connected with vintage tech sure. hunters, mm-hmm. and maybe with your show because I we were talking, we didn't get into it as much, but this erasure that I'm talking. Remember, we used to collect uh, if we liked comedy, we'd have the DVD box set, yes, and we'd collect. Maybe we'd read books. Remember, we used to read books, mm-hmm. like actual yeah. books. I still do. Yeah. yeah, and so we'd have all this stuff, and you'd collect it, and you'd have your little library, and now you, you've got a comedy show. And it's, I assume, like, is it, can you buy a Blu-ray set of Baroness Von Sketch? No. no. You cannot DVD. buy a physical so hard copy. it's sort of it. ephemeral, it's sort of weirdly just a thing that's here now and yeah. hopefully it's around. How do you feel about that? Like, you're making so much content, as we discussed. And I it's don't know. Co- my, my friend, uh, Matt, he was saying, you know, like, it, you know, when the apocalypse finally does come, no one's going to know what actually happened in this point in history because so little of it is, is transmitted yes. by the printed word. Mm-hmm. So it's like, how will we know it tweets and like, you know, like everyday drama and all that kind of stuff. And so I actually started sending a postcard. And it's funny because like so many of the things that are neuromancer, people don't know this novel. This is like a seminal novel that it was like the, 1982 or yeah. something. This, so William Gibson wrote it. He coined the term cyberspace. I believe. Cyber, somebody, cyberpunk as well, I cyberpunk. believe. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so many of the, he, he goes into minutia of how people dress and why they are and like there's stuff, every, you know, the kibble or kimmel or whatever it's called from the, from uh, uh, Blade Runner and like it, there's just stuff all around and all these layers of things but we, we don't, like we actually have stuff we could put on a Blu-ray. We have scenes that didn't make it, bloopers, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, there, there's a body of th- stuff, but it's like, how are we going to do that? Like, I guess we'll have to... You know, I, unfortunately, I think what has to happen is that it, the show has to get to, to the po- point where it's so popular that people want to buy that. Like, we're just not there. Oh, like, I, I think, see. I think it has to get to, like, the point where people get obsessive and want to collect it, and then maybe that will happen. But yeah. I agree, it's kind of weird. I feel okay that there's no physical thing of it right now like mm-hmm. I, I just feel like that's we're just not in that moment we're in this binge talk about it you know orally share what you you know I was in um, I was in LA a couple of weeks ago and uh, I went to go see a, a, an art show of Annie Leibovitz's early photographs and it was really funny because I like my thing is I just eavesdrop all the time so I'm really sorry if you've been having a personal <laughs> conversation I was totally listening but that's how I get comedy uh, and I was like walking around I'm listening to what everyone's talking about and 
all they were talking about is what they were watching on Netflix. Like, everybody. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I was just yeah. like, oh my God, this is a weird cultural moment. But at the same point, it means that, like, we're talking about stories and we're sharing them. It's kind of beautiful in a weird way. Mm-hmm. We are talking more. Like, we're communicating about what we consume. But it's just like when you watch Sean's show, it's fascinating the stuff you find mm-hmm. and what it says about our past. And like yeah. we were just saying, like, I don't know if our present is going to have a past, if that makes any sense. Right. In the future. Like, no one's going to be able to pick the stuff we're rooting, what you're rooting through is stuff from the mid, early and mid 20th century mostly, right? Yeah. We're, I mean, in some cases, we're, we're finding things that are, uh, you know, over 100 years old and yeah. they've mm-hmm. still got some, like, technological mm-hmm. aspect to them. But yeah, a lot of technology today, uh, you know, I can't speak about the, the media content because we don't really look for that stuff mm-hmm. for the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but it is like, it, it's very disposable. And it's like, you know, once you don't have this phone charger cord anymore, oh, like yeah. that phone's not going to charge anymore. Yeah. So like, yeah. uh, like technology changed very slowly for so long. And now it's just so fast. And like yeah. the things that we can do with what we have now is incredible. But yeah. it's nice to go back to like this this one appliance does one thing. Only. Yeah. yeah. I, I started, I was reading the novels actually because I got to the point where I was like, I am on Reddit too much. <laughs> I'm reading too many tiny little things and my, you know, it's getting faster and faster yeah. and faster. And I, I do love reading. And I was like, I do, I would like to like coast on a long story right now. I would, right. I would, I would like that a little bit well, more. So I have many people, not many people, but uh, people have tried to convince me about e-readers and I've had them and stuff like that. But I actually like the physical sensation of yeah. a book. I me like too. everything, but also you cannot bring that shit into a bath. No, nope. you, know? you just can't. And everybody has dropped their book in the bath at least once. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, right. Sure. And what, yeah. if, what if the power goes off? And what if the power yeah. goes off? But yeah. I also do wonder too, like just about like, I worked in a record store for a bazillion years and I remember when I was working in a record store it was records and then CDs came in Mm -hmm. and then the records slowly went away and now they're back in such a huge way and I had totally forgotten how much pleasure I got out of browsing for records out of looking for like the magic of opening up a record and going oh my god will there be lyrics all the lyrics are printed and when they're a double album they open up there's something cool there (laughs) so I, I wonder if we will come back to a thing because with DVDs and box sets having worked in a record store I know a lot of it was about the extra material and the things that nobody else got so I think it probably will come back around because I think we're acquisitive uh, yep. by nature and yep. people uh, especially men uh, really like to collect things and are completionists so they like to have mm. all of the things uh, <laughs> I want to show you my house in Skyrim and you can call uh, I oh I know okay so Aurora and I were being deep game nerds like Aurora I remember she told me one day she's like I just took everything out of my house and I made a pile and it took me you know 12 hours and I crashed the computer and <laughs> I did do that in Skyrim I tried to walk onto the tundra and drop everything I owned just to see what it would look like and it, and it broke the Xbox yeah so we have these conversations and the other two baronesses just are like look at us like we're nuts but we know. Yeah, we know. We know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Stardew Valley is a great game, by the way. One of the top ten gotta, selling gotta, Switch games. We gotta cut this off because yeah. the, the people have oh. to do other things. Oh, okay. Well, there's other people coming. It's just a video right. game bonanza. Did you guys oh, ever no. play uh, Mike Tyson's Punch Out? I used to play that. Yes, I oh yeah. Punch Out. Oh, yeah. yeah. On Nintendo, anybody? That was NES. Good oh, game. Sorry, that's all I can contribute to the gaming right now. But Sean's trying to school me on the gaming. That's well, like the nature Sean, of Sean, I'm going to follow you on Twitter and then we can okay, talk yeah. about gaming. Okay, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll do something gaming related. Yes. I, I love it. I, yes. If anyone wants to talk about God of War, I'm available. I've been talking <laughs> nice. about God of War a lot. We have Boy. to, we have yeah. to wrap up the show. That's one of my jobs is to actually start the show and end the show. I thank you all for being here. Thanks to Sean Hatton, Thanks, Aurora everybody. Brown, Jennifer Whalen from Baroness Von Sketch Show, The Bicycles, James Keast, everybody a long winter. That's the end of our season. Thank you so much. If we're not canceled, we'll be back next year. Have a good night. Go enjoy Workman Arts. Thank you.